Hello. Hi, good evening. This is Sarah Chiu. The program is Basket Starfish, our language call. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the ball that I talked about last time. And you will see that how come a ball of yarn will uh, end up become uh, linked to the sound cue. Because if you look at the word cue, it is really a circle with a tail coming out. And also it uh, how it links, you know, to the uh, human idea of the heritage because, you know, it is everything to do with the thread, the first human technology. So I'm going to start my program now. And uh, once again, um, if you want to understand uh, all the past, you know, uh, episodes that I talk about, the A and the K, all the different alphabets, you can type in uh, the YouTube, you know, Basket Starfish, our language core. You will find all the past 47 episodes and tonight should be the uh, 48th episode. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, Again, I want to present to you, you know, what a basket starfish looks like for those who are not familiar. Uh, my point is that we are all sharing uh, one common language core. All human languages are just branches from the same uh, center and no one is actually above uh, the other. And uh, none of us are separate family trees. And because if we believed in that, we also usher in human hierarchy. And that's why I, uh, pr I propose that it needs to be changed uh, instead of a tree we should look at our human language like a whole organism like a starfish okay and um, again you know the sound base that I use for this research you know is Cantonese Chinese in a southern dialect in ancient dialect and also um, I, I would say all other dialects are also ancient okay and the other thing is that uh, I have been traveling around for more than 20 years just uh, for this research so uh, here I am, you know, I have a different view as an Asian female traveler, uh, different from the uh, academic view that you are used to. So uh, be bear with me so you can see my point of view, okay? Uh, first of all, last week I talked about the first artificial round object in human history, which is uh, a ball of yarn. And the word and the alphabet, I mean the consonant involved, you know, will be uh, mainly a few uh, that you can see here. Uh, what I show you here, this is an Egyptian hieroglyph right here, uh, which has the W sound. And uh, what I propose is that uh, because I travel around from uh, place to place, and then I hear all this sound shifting. So the W is very easily uh, mutated to R. That's why you have the uh, world and then you have the wrong word so the w easily from word to ra and then the other way it can go is from word to ver to fur to ber to per okay so all these you know actually very easily shifted uh, because chinese are not an alphabetic system so we are very used to people pronouncing things differently we would not say that they they speak wrongly because we are very adapted to it. So I think sometimes when they're too fixed in this writing system, which are uh, really, if you have watched my program, you will understand that, you know, uh, uh, the, the alphabet system depend, uh, is not very dependable when you try to use it to try to fix sound, okay? And then I want you to see that, you know, all this uh, consonant here, the word or fur, fur, Per, per, they all kind of you know have a potential of motion as you can see from this ball right here is it rolling around but then you have to also understand you know the more I dwell with the language changes from place to place the more I understand a very interesting phenomenon every single word always has a, its polar meaning and even the consonant when I just said that it is the potential of motion all these things you know even in a full or ball or, 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 or the para if you speak Spanish is the stop word so they all um, all uh, give you a polar meaning it also means something stationary so how can it be something that you know that station not moving at the same time also convey to you you know a movement it is 
um, believe it or not, it is also following the law of physics. So what is the law of physics? You know, if you study uh, physics, I'm not, you know, but this is a very common uh, understanding that every object, you know, holds two kinds of energy. One is this potential energy, We even when it's sitting there just like a ball, and then the kinetic energy, you know, when it's set in motion, then it becomes a kinetic energy. So if you want to see the A and the K sound, you, you can uh, go to the YouTube and find my episode about the letter A and the letter K, okay? So it's closely related to this kin sound right there. Um, I will show you this kind of movement. This is a Sumerian um, uh, cuneiform, and then uh, this is a Chinese uh, writing. Uh, both of them also used to mean, you know, some kind of a braid or a rope. Okay, this, so you can see that as the horn head circling around. They that they used to express this unseen energy that virtually become the rope or a thread itself. Okay, but if we don't uh, tie it to any uh, object specifically so you can understand it in a western way is that uh, you can look at it as an A okay so it's the same like when you put an A you know in front of a word you know it can uh, mean to an action to do something and then also when you put an A it also means it's polar uh, meaning it can mean anti or against so uh, the, this is this Chinese uh, oracle bone precisely means anti and against, okay? So it is very interesting that always, you know, you use the same symbol, sometimes they mean completely the opposite. So um, I, uh, as you can see, you know, you can only see two entity right there. You can easily see that as the Chinese yin and yang sign, but then I wouldn't say that this is the unique example because if you look deeper, even in the Chinese world, you will have the two uh, dual world or you have the three legged uh, form like that even the Phoenician well, of course you see here you will call it Celtic but you will understand that if you look at the flag of Sicily you will see the three legged you know a uh, wheel like that or you can go even further it will be a four point you know turning point but uh, of course it will become a swastika of course now shamefully we use the swastika to mean something very sinister to human being but if you look at this Sumerian uh, sign this is uh, this earliest swastika is actually a representation of a female goddess so once again this is a very uh, this was a very matriarchal world and this is all the beneficial of the uh, female symbol so uh, as time went by the patriarchal world took over and a lot of these things you know took up a sinister uh, role and also because of the monotheism comes on all this paganism hit was hidden behind but you can see that from the very early beginning human being was trying to sort out their concepts so these uh, concepts were understood uh, by the ancients you know uh, a long long time ago so uh, even now if you talk about the law of physics you know that is still the same that um, uh, everything you know holds is two uh, extremes of potentials okay so I will see, uh, yeah, I just want to see how it's uh, swing around. And uh, again, you know, uh, since a long time ago, you know, the con human concept has been intermingled. Uh, the, the etymology of word is never, never as linear as uh, a lot of linguists want you to, to see. A lot of linguists nowadays, you know, are, uh, are from uh, European, European base, and a lot of them are men's view. So I am presenting to you an Asian, uh, females point of view okay um, and uh, once again I use this ball of thread to give you an, an example okay this is early cuneiform again you will see that bull horn existed as an unseen energy that means the spinning of the thread and then any circular motion in a cuneiform they also use some horn head remember at the very beginning the horn head is not necessarily a bull it can be a cow as well just like when you see a 
uh, heather in ancient Egypt, you know, uh, even though you see the horn, you know, they are not bull, they are female entity, okay? So um, again, um, this uh, is actually rope, uh, the symbol of rope in ancient Sumerian, and let's compare it to the Chinese. Look at the Chinese, they have very, very um, similar concept in their head when these words were formed, and gradually as time went by, this become various, you know, written form in Chinese, and the sound we carry is Y, okay, in Cantonese, and then uh, it can make, mean a leather braid, uh, it means a leather rope actually, and also it means an, anything surrounding or in circle or bend or crooked and going around, okay. So on the other side of the world, I want to compare to this Egyptian hieroglyph, this is also carry a W sound, compare this uh, Y and this W, and then they all mean circular motion, okay? But uh, I will divide it so you can see that, you know, uh, the concepts are never, never as pure as you, you think they are. They are never linear. They are always mixed like a mess of tangled thread, okay? So um, I give you these two words, you know, it can easily uh, be understood because even the word weaving and the warp thread and the web thread, you know, are the the web, I mean, I are uh, the threads that keep going wrong and wrong on its own, and which form the cloth, the basic, basic human necessity. Okay, and then uh, of course the weaver become uh, the German word for uh, a tangle or something entangle, as you can see, is the thread. The weaver is the Dutch, you know, you can see it still with the W. And if you go to Northern U European uh, language, sometimes you know they can change into a V. Okay, instead of a W, they become a V, and also in Sanskrit, a lot of the weaving will become a V, so uh, this is what I call the sound uh, interchange and sound shifting, but I will uh, uh, draw a line here, on this side, you, you will see that the other um, uh, concept will be intermingled with this here, and this word compared to weft, and then weft, this is English word, right, in order to dis visually distinguish them, you know, they, they are put on two different uh, uh, vowel there, but what is waft? Waft has to do with, you know, um, the motion through the air. As you can see, you know, here as a symbol, simple symbol like that, it can be very neutral. It can uh, contain very various concept in meaning other than the world. It can actually mean this kind of well, of course, it can be water, it can be air, okay? The uh, basic thing I will show you is the word wind also start with the W. So in English, a lot of this either is audio cue and also visual cue, okay? And of course, you know, the whiff of air as well. And But then you, uh, you will notice something very interesting. Why is it they put an H right there when they don't really sound that, um, but I have shown you you know when I was explaining the light H sound with the H sound, the heavier H sound, the H sound even in Cantonese in Chinese, you know, is hey, that which really means air. So you can see that even in English, the the light H is, H is put there to visually indicate that it has something to do with the unseen air. But on this side, you know, when the heavy H high like this, it actually means more of a thread, okay? So this is Chinese high. This is the H, H in, um, uh, I mean, Hebrew, ancient Hebrew. And then, of course, that become, you know, your Latin H, the modern H. So you will see that, you know, all these are intermingled. You will see that each culture conserve part of the whole story. None of us preserve the whole. By sep uh, the linguists now, by separating us more, we can never find the truth. That's why I keep proposing that by combining all uh, languages together, we can find the truth of our origin of the orange of the languages. Okay. Okay, so um, again, I will go back to what I was speaking last time, you know, why a sphere was necessary um, in weaving, okay? So uh, again, this is called a hank. Again, um, as you can see, this is the uh, like the early Egyptian uh, hieroglyph writing and which be carried the he sound as well. This is the hank even to this day in the weaving industry and then which comes to a ball, okay? All the process, you know, uh, why a sphere and I also explained to you last week that 
when you buy this yarn ball uh, knitting why they don't make it a round ball because it will be very frustrating to you when the ball keep rolling around but why is it the ball was necessary in, in weaving you will see again later I will show you some video but uh, as uh, we develop the weaving industry and um, we make more and more cloth you know the Greek also have this S sign as you can see it's uh, all the symbols of something rolling just like the Greek word sphere right actually it is a very visual clue give a lot of visual clue uh, to tell you what the sphere is it's something keep rolling you see even the S is ro rolling the F is rolling and the R is rolling and it is really something rolling you know so uh, early Greek is also to me you know uh, uh, a, a very visual language as well so again I want to see I want you to see this you see it is important to invent the ball because you know in order to quicken the pace up it has to be rolled around as I said last week this should be the beginning of all our ball games and you look at the woman I cannot film the woman but you can see that you know she's very technique in throwing the ball around and as they change color of the thread look at how they are still rolling them imagine how many times they have rolled the ball and how much they have quickened the whole process instead of having something not round okay so again this is more industrial when the fi fabric gets uh, longer the ball will choose to travel through the air This can this speed can only achieve when it is a ball form, a speed sphere form. So can you see that they are also changing color? It was brown, now it's white. And then they change color, look at that. Can you imagine how much more slow if they have to walk back and forth instead of the ball traveling in the air? Okay, so this is another video. But these days, because we don't do weaving anymore, so we have lost touch of the real world. And that's when the time language was formed. Okay, so uh, I want to show, you know, a little bit more about the sound itself, the sound and concept in writing. This is a Chinese word, heal, okay, or, or, or kill. And when I look up the dictionary, this very complicated part actually means, you know, the flow of light. So if I simplify it, it will be like this form. It's just like a hole. The top part is a hole. And then this flow of water or light comes down and it has the sound of heal or kill. Okay. It means a hole or opening, a key to something, or it actually means the anus. You will see that as a hole that something comes out, okay? Of course, you know, in, as I said last week, you know, the quelle uh, in Latin and also in German, both means the source, the spring or the well. Now can you can imagine that as a hole with water coming out. And then uh, all this related word, you know, I show you this a couple of weeks ago. And the word Q, a Q means you know, a line attaching to a source. Again, you see that's why it's, it's the sound is Q. And the Q2 is a line, a signal linking to something. And then a Q, a ball of thread, as you can see, it's exactly this shape. 
or the clue, a line or signal linking to something. So you can understand all this, you know, as the form like that. But of course, now because we, we use so many words, we have to visually distinguish them by different spelling. But basically, you know, the earlier sound will be just the Q sound, okay? And then um, again, I want to explain this. I will show you some pictures so you understand it better. I sat for hours and hours with people who are doing the process of, of weaving and, and trilling. And these are the pictures I took uh, in, in Yemen with some of the veteran families. And uh, the end product, you know, will be this ball of uh, yarn coming out. And I compare it to the Chinese sound. Look at this. This is an English word. Okay, Q. And this is, we have a sound, Kao. Okay, Q and Kao. Kao means uh, speedy and ro uh, in rolling or throwing. And then we have another word, which sounds as Kao. The same sound, actually. It means the ball or the sphere or the globe. Okay. And then uh, we have a sign like this. And which become like that when we add the determinative of the thread and the writing it's like this nowadays but the sound is kill in colloquially is kill kill or gao okay so you will see that these are all this a little bit of mutation the curve become the girl but they all mean to trow to roll together or simply the three ply thread or any action of curve or bending okay which become also the english q okay so um i will show you how linear you know the in the western world it is so in english if you look up the word q uh, it will tell you that it links to the english word queuing or q or it of germanic origin related to dutch q okay so uh, because you know, most of the linguists and um, they only look at the western language you know they can only uh, tracing to the proto-european language they do not link themselves to any other languages but I will show you another way of looking at it okay so if you look at the word Q the, the writing Q like that and compare with the reality that ball with the line coming out of course in English you you have a Q as a ball of thread and you have Q in as they said you know in Dutch you know is a tangle or a Q and then you have Arabic Kura which a ball a sphere and then Greek in, in Swedish, it mean, also means tango. And then you have kyo in Chinese, means to twist around. And kao, which develop into two ways. One is the speedy action. The other one is really a ball in a sphere. And then the kyo or kyo to trill. Or the kao is actually mean a yarn ball. Look at this. Chain, uh, Cantonese cow and cowba and also this kill okay so they are all the same similar sound it's only by written way that we distinguish ourselves and the linguists tell you that we speak different languages but no a lot of color I mean a lot of the vocabulary we share were actually from the very same source okay it's only grammar that separate us and then the Greek word klino is also you know to do with the curve Curving and bending and cook close also means a cycle a circle you will see all this clean cook all means like that but if I look further back you know you will I will compare three ancient forms for you this is ancient Egyptian Sumerian it has the sound of cool or go cook and this is Chinese look at how similar they are we have the cook as well which means curve even the word curve you know is is this sharing the same root okay and then the Arabic form look at this curve right here this is a K uh, alphabet in in um, Arabic so look at all this form they they were still able to chase back to very, very early origin. And then the other way of writing a K in Arabic will be like this. It's still, it is a curved form, okay? So, again, uh, uh, linking to the uh, thread itself, you know, I will show you how uh, people use 
uh, were obsessed in the uh, lineage using the Q word. Okay, this is a source, uh, a hole with the water or line coming out. Okay, in a way they can use the eye to uh, represent this. The eye have different uh, ways of expressing. Uh, part of it is this old form right there. The Chinese or the ancient Sumerian also used the pubic triangle to 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 represent this source. Uh, and this is also a Chinese writing means the mouth or the opening is also another way of expressing this source and this is an ancient Egyptian hieroglyph you can see that the human being is like a, a source you know with water or light flowing out and then this is their real writing means human and this is Chinese writing it has to do with the, the font actually you can understood as a Latin word you know we, we say it font in Chinese and you can understand it as font is Latin it's like the fountain okay you see the water from coming down this is we pronounce it as hing it's, it's like your brothers it's from coming from the same bowl and then of course it has to do uh, with childbirth and then uh, Chinese has the same compared to the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph we have human being or a multitude of people the same way and again this Q or sound if you uh, this is Q in Chinese you can say Q in your English way and then it is a hole with this flowing down so if I put the three concepts together it will be very very similar ancient Egyptian hieroglyph Chinese Q and then your Q word they are all pointing to some kind of a source okay so okay I am going to finish right here and I still have a little bit of time and I know that I have to pull from different direction to make you understand how entangled all these uh, etymologies are it's only by understanding this you know that uh, we can find the source of our communication and our, our origin because otherwise if we put everything as a linear form we can and never really find any connection as you can see we throw words backward and forward nothing is so pure as a line and we have to uh, give us our, our chance you know because otherwise you know we will have all this you know uh, phobia you know for other people now you know the world has a lot of problem with anti-semitism with anti-muslim with anti whatever so it's all because we think our own culture is unique Yes, we are unique in a way, but I don't think we are all un that unique that uh, we don't have other uh, partners.